Julius Productions. Sit down, get comfy, and away your aura. Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Horror Narrations with Count Julius. Today we will be reading Count Magnus. The link to the original story will be in the description below. Please like, subscribe, and comment as it really helps me out. Without further ado, let's get started. By what means the paper out of which I have made a connected story came into my hands is the last point which the reader will learn from these pages. But it is necessary to prefix my extracts from them, a statement of the form in which I possess them. They consist then partly of a series of collections for a book of travels, such a collection and volume was a common product of the 40s and 50s, Horace Marriott's Journal of Residence in Jutland, and the Danish Isles as a fair specimen of the class to which I allude. These books are usually treated of some of the unknown district in the continent. They were illustrated with woodcuts or steel plates. They gave details of the hotel accommodation, and the means of communication such as we now expect to find in any well-regulated guidebook, and they dealt largely in reported conversations with intelligent foreigners, racing keepers, and garrulous peasants. In a word, they were chatty. Begun with the idea of furnishing material for such a book, my papers as they progressed assumed the character of a record one single personal experience, and this record was continued up to the very eve, almost of its termination. The writer was a Mr. Raxwell, for my knowledge of him I have to depend entirely on the evidence of his writings afford, and from these I deduce he was a man past middle age, possessed some private means, and he was very much alone in the world. He had, it seems, settled abode in England, but was a denizen of hotels and boarding houses. It is probable that he entertained the idea of settling down at some future time, which never came. And I think it also is likely that the Pantagen of Fire in the early 70s must have destroyed a great deal that would have thrown light on his attendance. For he refers only once or twice to the property of his that was warehouse at the establishment. It is further apparent that Mr. Waxwell had published a book, and that it treated of a holiday he once taken in Brittany. More than this I cannot say about his work, because a diligent search for a bibliographical works has convinced me that it must have appeared either anonymously or under a pseudonym. As to his character, it's not difficult to form some superficial opinion. He must have been an intelligent and cultivated man. It seems he was near being a fellow of his college at Oxford. But since, as I judge from the calendar, his besetting fault was pretty clearly that of over-inquisitiveness, possibly a good fault in a traveller, Certainly a fault for when a traveller paid dearly enough in the end. On what proved to be his last expedition, he was plotting another book. Scandinavia, a region not widely known to Englishmen, 40 years ago, had struck him as an interesting find. He must have alighted some old books of Swedish history or four memoirs and the idea had struck him that there were room for a book descriptive of travel in Sweden, intersped with episodes from history of some great Swedish families. He procured letters of introduction, therefore, to some person's quality in Sweden, and set out further in the 
early summer of 1863. Of his travels in the north there is no need to speak, nor is his residence of some weeks in Stockholm. I need only mention that some savant resident there put him on a track of an important collection of family papers belonging to the proprietors and ancient manor house in Vester Gothland, and obtained for him permission to examine them. The manor house or Herrgard in question is to be called a Rabak, though it has not its name. It is one of the best buildings of its kind in all the country, and the picture of it in Dalmbud, Suisha, Antica and Martina, engraved at 1694, shows it as very much as the tourist may see it today. It was built soon after 1600, and is roughly speaking, very much like an English house of that period. In respect of material, red brick with stone facings and style. The man who built it was a scion of the great house of Del and his descendants possess it still. Del is the name by which I will designate them when mention of them becomes necessary. They received Mr. Raxwell with great kindness and curiosity and pressed him to stay in the house as long as research lasted. But preferring to be independent and mistrusting his powers of conversing in Swedish, he settled himself at the village inn, which turned out quite sufficiently comfortable. At any rate, during the summer months, this arrangement would entail a short walk daily to and from the manor house of something under a mile. The house itself stood in a park and was protected we should say grown up, with a large old timber. Near it you found the walled garden, and then entered a close wood fringing upon the small lakes, with which the whole country is pitted. Then came the wall of the demands, and you climbed a steep knoll, a knob of a rock covered slightly with soil. And on the top of this stood the church, fenced in with tall, dark trees. It was a curious building to English eyes. The nave and aisles were low, and filled with pews and galleries. In the western gallery stood the handsome old organ, gaily painted, and with silver pipes. The ceiling was flat, and had been adjourned by a a 17th century artist with a strange and hideous last judgment. Full of lurid flames, falling cities, burning ships, and crying souls, and brown and smiling demons. Handsome brass coronet hung from the roof. The pulpit was a doll's house covered with the painted wooden cherubs and saints. A stand with a three-hour glass was hinged to the preacher's desk. Such sights as these may be seen in many a church in Sweden now. But what distinguished this one was in addition to the original building at the eastern end of the North Isle. The building of the manor house had erected a mausoleum for himself and his family. It was a largish eight sided building lighted by a series of windows and had been covered in a domed roof topped by a kind of a pumpkin shaped object rising into a spire or a form which Swedish architects greatly delighted. The roof was of copper externally and it was painted black where the walls in common with those of the church were staringly white. To this mausoleum there was no access from the church. It had a portal and steps of its own on its northern side. Past the churchyard the path to the village goes and not more than three or four minutes bring you to the indoor. On the first day of his stay at Rabak, 
Mr. Waxwell found the church door open and found these notes of the exterior and interior, which I have epitomized into the mausoleum, however, he could not make his way. He could, by looking through the keyhole, just describe that there were fine marble effigies and sarcophagi of copper and a wealth of armorial ornament, which made him very anxious to spend some time in investigation. The papers he had come to examine at the manor house proved to be just of the kind he wanted for his book. There were family correspondence, journals, and account books of the earliest owner of the estate, very carefully kept and clearly well written. Full of amusing and picturesque detail, the first de Ligardère appeared in them as a strong and capable man. Shortly after the building of the mansion, there had been a period of distress in the district, and the peasants had risen up and attacked several chateaux and done some damage. The owner of Rablac took a leading part in suppressing trouble, and there was a reference to executions of ringleaders and severe punishments inflicted with no sparing hand. The portrait of this Magnus de la Gardière was one of the best in the house, and Mr. Waxwell studied it with no little interest after his day's work. He gives no detailed description of it, but I gather that his face was impressed by him rather by its power than a beauty or goodness. In fact, he writes that the Count Magnus was an almost phenomenally ugly man. On this day, Mr. Waxwell took his supper with his family and walked back into the late but still bright evening. I must remember, he writes, to ask the sexton if he can let me into the mausoleum at the church. He evidently has access to it himself. I saw him tonight standing on the steps. And as I thought, locking or unlocking the door, I find that early on the morning, on the following day, Roxwell had some conversation with his landlord. His setting it down at such length does surprise me at first, but I soon realized that the papers I was reading were, at least in the beginning, the materials for the book he was meditating, and that it would have been one of those quasi-journalistic productions which admit the introduction of an admixture of conversational matter. His object, he says, was to find out whether any traditions of Count Magnus de Ligardier lingered on the scenes of that gentleman's activity, and whether the popular estimate of him were favorable or not. He found that the Count was decidedly not a favorite. If his tenants came late to their work on the days which they owed to him, as the lord of the manor they were set on the wooden horse, or flogged and branded in the manor house yard. One or two cases there were men who had occupied lands which encroached on the lord's domain, and whose houses had been mysteriously burnt on a winter's night, with the whole family inside. But what seemed to dwell on the innkeeper's mind most for he returned to the subject more than once, was that the Count had been on the Black Pilgrimage and brought something back, or someone, with him. You will naturally inquire, as Mr. Waxwell did, that what did the Black Pilgrimage may have been, but your curiosity on the point must remain unsatisfied for the time being. Just as he did. The landlord is evidently unwilling to give us an answer, or indeed any answer, on the point and being called out for a moment, shrouded out with obvious alacrity, only putting his head in at the door a few minutes afterwards to say he was called away to Skara and should not be back till evening.
So Mr. Waxwell had gone satisfied to his day's work at the manor house. The papers on which he was just then engaged soon put to his thoughts into another channel, for he had to occupy himself with glancing over the correspondence between Sophia Albertania in Stockholm and her married cousin Ulrika Lenoria at Rabak in the years 1705-10. to 10. The letters were exceptional interest from the light they threw upon the culture of that period in Sweden, as anyone who could testify who has read the full edition of them in the publications of Swedish Historical Manuscripts Commission. In the afternoon, he had done with this, and after returning the boxes in which they were kept to their places on the shelf, he proceeded very carefully to take down some of the volumes nearest to them, in order to determine which of them had best his principal subject of investigation next day. The shelf he had hit upon them was occupied mostly by a collection of account books in the writing of Count Magnus. But among one of them was not an account book, but a book of alchemical and other tracts in another 16th century hand. Not being very familiar with alchemical literature, Mr. Waxwell spends much space which he might have spared in setting out the names and beginnings of the various treatises. The Book of the Phoenix, Book of the Thirty Words, Book of the Toad, Book of Miriam, Turba Philosophorum, and so forth. And then announces with a good deal of circumstance that at the light of finding a leaf originally left near the blank in the middle of the book, some writing of Count Magnus himself headed Liber Nigra Paragonitis. It is true that only a few lines were written, but there was quite enough to show that the landlord had that morning had been referring to a belief at least as old as time of Count Magnus, and probably shared by him. This is the English of what is written. If any man desires to obtain a long life, if he would obtain a faithful messenger and see the blood of his enemies, it is necessary that he should first go into the city of Torzin and salute the prince. Here there was an erasure of one word, not very thoroughly done, so that Mr. Waxwell felt pretty sure he was right in reading it as Arius of the air. But there was no more text copied, only a line in Latin. Quere reliquia hujus materia inter sacroria. See the rest of this matter among more private things. It could be not denied that this threw a rather lurid light upon the tastes and beliefs of the Count. But to Mr. Waxwell, separated from him by nearly three centuries, the thought that he might have added to his general forcefulness alchemy, and to alchemy something like magic only made him a more picturesque figure, and when, after a rather prolonged contemplation in the picture of his whole, Mr. Waxwell set out on his homeward way. His mind was full of the thought of Count Magnus. He had no eyes for his surroundings, no perception of the evening scents of the woods, or the evening light on the lake, and when all of a sudden he pulled up short, he was astonished to find himself already at the gate of the churchyard within a few minutes of his dinner. His eyes fell on the mausoleum. Ah, oh, he said. Count Magnus, there you are. I should dearly like to see you. Like many solitary men, he writes, I have a habit of talking to myself aloud. And unlike some of the Greek and Latin particles, I do not expect an answer. Certainly, and perhaps fortunately in this case, there was... Neither voice nor any that regarded 
Only the women who I suppose was cleaning up the church dropped a metallic object on the floor whose clang startled me. Count Magnus, I think, sleeps well enough. That same evening, the landlord of the inn, who had heard Mr. Waxwell say that he wished to see the clerk of deacon, as he would be called in Sweden, of the parish, introduced him to the official inn parlor. A visit to the Del Gardier tomb house was soon arranged for the next day, and a little conversation ensued. Mr. Maxwell, remembering that one function of the Scandinavian deacons is to teach candidates for confirmation, thought he would refresh his memory by a biblical point. Can you tell me, he said, anything about Chorizen? The deacon seemed startled, but readily reminded him how that village had once been denounced. To be sure, said Mr. Waxwell, it is, I suppose, a ruin now? So I expect, replied the deacon. I have heard some of our old priests say that the Antichrist is to be born there, and there are tales. Ah, what tales are those? Mr. Waxwell put in. Tales I was going to say, which I had forgotten, said the deacon, and soon after that he said good night. The landlord was all alone. All alone. And at Mr. Waxwell's mercy, and the inquirer was not inclined to spare him. The landlord was now alone and at Mr. Waxwell's mercy. Oh, so much. And Nelson, he said, I have found something out about the black pilgrimage. You may as well tell me what you know. What did the Count bring back with him? Swedes are habitually slow, perhaps in answering, or perhaps the landlord was an exception, I am not sure. But Mr. Rexwell notes that the landlord spent at least one minute looking him in, in the eye before he said anything at all. Then he came close up to the guest, and with a great deal of effort he spoke. Mr. Waxwell, I can tell you one little tale and no more. Not any more. You must not ask anything when I have done in my grandfather's time. That is, ninety-two years ago. There were two men who said, The Count is dead. We do not care for him. We will go tonight and have a free hunt in this wood. The long wood on the hill that you have seen behind Rabak. Well, those that heard him say that do not go, we are sure you will meet with persons walking who should not be walking. They should be resting, not walking. These men laughed. There were no forest men to keep the wood because no one wished to live there. The family were not at the house. These men could do what they wished. Very well, they go into the wood that night. My grandfather was sitting in there in his room. It was summer and a light night. With the window open, he could see out into the wood and hear. So he sat there, and two or three men with him, and they listened. At first they hear nothing at all, and then they hear someone, you know how far away it is. They hear someone scream, just as if the most inside part of their soul was twisted out of them. All of them in the room caught hold of each other, and they sat so for three quarters of an hour. They then hear someone else, only about three hundred ells off. They hear him laugh out loud. <laughs> it was not one of those men that laughed. And indeed, they have all of them said that it was not any man at all. After that, they hear a great door shut. Then... When you was just light with the sun, they all went to the priest. They said to him, Father, 
Put on your gown and your ruff, and come to bury these men, Anders Bjorsen and Hans Thorbjorn. You understand that they were sure these men were dead, so they went to the wood. My grandfather never forgot this. He said that there were all so many dead men themselves. The priest, too, he was in a white fear. He said when they came to him, I only heard one cry in the night, and I heard one laugh afterwards. If I cannot forget that, I shall not be able to sleep again. So they went to the wood, and found these men on the edge of the wood. Hans Theobon was standing with his back against the tree, and all the time he was pushing with his hands, pushing something away from him that was not there. So he was not dead, and they led him away, and took him to the house at Nyukpoing, and he died before the winter. But he went on pushing with his hands, also Anders Bjornsson was there, but he was dead. And I tell you about Anders Bjornsson, that he was once a beautiful man, but now his face was not there, because the flesh of it was sucked away from the bones. You understand that? My grandfather did not forget that. And they laid him on the bier which they brought. And they put a cloth over his head. And the priest walked before, and they laid and began to sing the psalm. For the dead as well they could. Hmm. So, as they were singing on the end of the first verse... One fell down, who was carrying the head out of the bear. And the others looked back, and they saw that the cloth had fallen off, and the eyes of Anders Bjornsson were looking up, because there was nothing to close over them. And this they could not bear. Therefore the priest laid the cloth upon him, and sent for a spade, and they buried him in that place. The next day, Mr. Waxwell records that the deacon called for him as soon as it was breakfast and took him to the church and mausoleum. He noticed that the key of the ladder was hung on a nail just by the pulpit, and it occurred to him that the church door seemed to be left unlocked as a rule. It would not be difficult for him to pay a second or more private visit to the monuments if there proved to be more of interest among them then could be digested at first. The building when he entered it he found not unimposing. The monuments, mostly large erections of the 17th and 18th centuries, were dignified if luxuriant, and the epitaphs and heraldry were copious. The central space of the domed Rome was occupied by the copper sarcophagi covered with finely ingrained ornament. Two of them had, as is commonly the case in Denmark and Sweden, a large metal crucifix on the lid. The third, that of Count Magnus, as it appeared, had instead of that a full-length effigy engraved upon it. And round the edge were several bands of similar ornament representing various scenes. One was of battle with cannons belching out smoke, and walled towns and troops of pikemen. Another showed an execution. In a third among trees was a man running at full speed with a flying hair and outstretched hands. After him followed a strange form. It would be hard to say whether the artist had intended it for a fun. But then, he touched the symbol, and fell, and fell, and fell. He made his way, his soul vanishing from his body, his mind vanishing as well, being absorbed by the corpse in the caskets.
This was the last moment of his life before becoming a zombie.